Whereas with Korean, I was kind of going in blind. Korean was just a blind challenge for me. And maybe just humble myself and say, you know, uh, it's not that easy. I need to just take it uh, baby steps. Hey everybody, it's been a while since I've done a Q&A video. I actually did one for my 200k and it's been a while since I hit 200k and I haven't actually finished the list of questions y'all had for me. So I'm gonna go through some of the questions you asked back then and do my part two. Uh, the first question is from Ariana and she said, oh sorry. <laughs> she says, uh, do you ever get that feeling of listening fatigue when you're immersed in a new foreign language? How do you deal with that? So listening fatigue is a term I've never encountered before, but how I understand it is perhaps a feeling of overwhelm from a new language that you may not understand completely, just a few words. And the more you listen to it, the more you feel very overwhelmed by how much you still have to learn. When I'm getting interested in a language, one of the first things I do is immerse myself as much as I can into listening uh, to the language. In a sense, it can be uh, tiring because you don't understand what you're uh, listening to. But I also kind of like that feeling and I try to hold on to that for a while because once you understand a language, there's no going back to that state of not even knowing what are words. Like in a whole sentence, you can't even pick out what's a word and what like what are two words when you don't understand anything. And I think it's a really beautiful transition going from knowing nothing to being able to understand a language. Um, of course, I don't wanna hold on to that too long because my aim is fluency. If you are feeling very overwhelmed, take a break. Uh, listening is not going to help you learn a language if you don't understand it. You need to supplement it and have a holistic approach to your language learning. Practicing speaking, learning vocab, writing, grammar, and listening. It's not just immersing yourself in one skill too much. If you're not understanding anything, there's no more benefit to just uh, getting used to the sound of the language. So be careful with how much listening you put in at the beginning of a language. Christine Ford says, where do you find the articles you read when learning languages? Do you have particular websites um, and an update on you personally, uh, how are you doing and what life looks like? Thank you, Christine, for that question. Let's start with where I find articles. Specifically for me, because I'm interested in design and tech, I find most of my articles on medium.com. Uh, they are also available in Spanish and I've seen a few Korean articles there. So if you're interested in psychology, tech, uh, design, you can check out Medium and just search for keywords in another language. Then uh, if you're learning Korean, I can also recommend brunch.kr. That is also a design website. Uh, for any other languages, usually there's something like news in slow something. So there's news in slow French or news in slow Spanish. Um, but honestly, how I stumbled across most of these websites is just by finding a keyword of something I'm interested in. So let's say you're interested in cooking and you're learning Italian. Learn the word for cooking in Italian and just do a Google search and you will find articles you might stumble across a website. Also finding news websites from each country, just a simple Google and uh, just uh, finding your own way around there. Hope, hope that kind of helps. And then an update on me personally, it's been going very well. I'm really enjoying my job here in Singapore. Uh, I feel very happy, I'm very at peace, and life is really good. Sometimes I feel a little overwhelmed with social media, feeling like I have to keep up um, with, with updates on languages and not having enough time to actually learn languages. But apart from that, um, I'm happy. I do miss seeing my family with, with the pandemic. I don't know when I'm gonna be able to travel again. I haven't seen my younger brother for years. He lives in the States. So hopefully next year, if we can travel again, I can see um, some friends and family. But thanks for asking. It's, um, I'm really happy. It's been good. Um, Anna is asking, how many hours do you spend learning languages during quarantine? And give us some advice to learn English. I'm sorry I cannot give you much more advice on learning English specifically apart from all the advice that I do put out in my videos on general language learning tips. As with any other language, just immerse yourself in it as much as possible. If you're always listening to your home language and you're not getting any English listening practice in, that's something you can change. So see if you can realize where your weak points are with English. Maybe you're struggling with spelling or speaking identify those key points and see how you can work on that 
and don't rush the process. Language learning takes very, very long, so just be patient with yourself. As for how many hours I spend learning languages during quarantine, um, so Singapore is not on a lockdown anymore. We kind of exited our lockdown uh, fairly quickly compared to the rest of the world. I'm not like stuck at home. I do go to the office twice a week and for the rest I work from home. Obviously with my job, I have to be working, so I don't have time to just sit around studying languages. I get most of my language learning in on the weekends and the evenings. So every Saturday or Sunday, depending on our availability, I meet with my French friend Ali and she is, uh, we just speak French for the whole day. And she helps me like read, uh, translate some words in a book, she gives me homework. Um, yeah, she's my best friend in Singapore and we, we, we have a full French day every week. So that's a few hours of French. I also have Hungarian lessons for one hour on Mondays and then I have Spanish for half an hour on Tuesdays and some weeks I do um, 45 minutes of Vietnamese and for the rest I'm just reviewing notes from italki and uh, kind of learning languages casually using using other apps like Duolingo or Jobs just to kind of play around and keep, keep the languages active um, for side languages like um, Tagalog or uh, what else am I learning? Vietnamese and um, Spanish Yes. <laughs> so I don't count the hours I learn a language ever. I don't think it's important to focus so much on how much time you are spending on a language, rather focus on what are you doing with the time you have. Whether you have five hours a week or one hour a week, what you do in that time is way more important than counting how many hours you have. It also freaks me out a little to tell myself I have to study X amount of hours a week and then when I don't do that when I feel tired or when I feel sick it's like I haven't accomplished my goals and I feel bad about that so I never measure my language learning in hours maybe that works for you uh, but I don't do that um next we have k-pop bay uh, where what are your biggest obstacles in the beginning of your language self-studying hmm Obstacles. I wonder if I set very high expectations for myself. Sometimes I feel like I, I want to be able to speak so fast and I have this expectation of myself to reach a certain level by a certain time. And that's not really an obstacle, but a mindset that I need to work on and maybe just humble myself and say, you know, uh, it's not that easy. I need to just take it uh, baby steps. Obstacles, also resources. There are so many resources available out there. How do I know which one is correct, which one to use? Uh, but I don't want to waste time. So I just start with whatever I have. Uh, I also think that pronunciation is quite tricky. I find that my accent, even in English, is very prone to being influenced by what I'm hearing around me. When I focus a lot on Japanese and I try and speak Korean, sometimes my Korean sounds more Japanese and vice versa. So whatever I expose my ears to, my mouth kind of duplicates. And maybe that is some kind of a coping mechanism that I've had growing up, moving countries a lot. When you try and fit in into friend groups, you try and emulate their accents when you're speaking. So I used to be in an American school, then I was in a South African school and my English accent changed a lot. So the point I'm trying to make is that I find accent is quite tricky uh, when I'm learning a language. Usually it's quite easy for me to imitate and replicate it at the start of my language learning journey, but as I go along, if I don't focus on that skill, it's very easy for it to fluctuate and change. Next question is from Sam. Do you ever feel frustrated towards languages or just dislike the idea of learning a new language? ¿Alguna vez te sentiste frustrada con los idiomas o te dejó de gustar el hecho de aprender nuevos idiomas? Very, muy bien, muy bien pregunta, muy bueno pregunta, no sé, lo siento. Pero sí es verdad que alguna vez me siento muy, ¿cómo se dice? Frustrada un poco y no es para la idea de aprender nuevo, nuevas idiomas, es solamente cuando estudia un idioma por muchos um, años o muchos um, meses, me siento un poco cansada cuando estudio un idioma por, para, por muchos, muchos meses o años y no progreso um, rápidamente. Rápido. I'm sorry, my Spanish still sucks. But to answer the question in English, I don't get that feeling of I don't want to learn a new language. 
but when I'm really into hitting the intermediate plateau and realizing that it's still hard and there's still a long way to go and I don't feel like I'm doing a lot of process progress yes I do feel tired and uh, what I just do is take a break it's completely fine the longer you have learned the language for the easier it is to take a break I took a break from Hungarian about three months or four months after starting it and it was very hard to get back into it because I had forgotten so much. Four months is not enough to give yourself a base um, to put the language on pause and then continue. If it's been a few years and you're feeling frustrated and want to take a break, yes, all of the knowledge you've learned will still be somewhere in your brain. It'll be a lot easier to pick it up again. As for learning a new language, that is always something that I want to do with my life. Um, not something I'll get tired of, but the process itself can be tiring. Next question is from John Payne. What are your thoughts on the joys and difficulties of living a Christian lifestyle abroad? Living a Christian lifestyle wherever you are will come with many joys and difficulties. Joys just being uh, the relationship you have with God and fellow Christians and being able to build really intimate friendships where you care for people and pray for people and grow together in Christ. And I would say the biggest thing for me is finding a church community. I've always grown up moving around a lot and it's been very hard um, for my family and I to find a church where we can settle in. So just once you feel comfortable you have to move again and you lose that church family. I, I grew a lot in our a church in Japan and the people I met there really had an impact on my, my growth as a Christian and when we moved away from Japan I didn't really have that much of a solid church that I could grow in uh, especially now during uh, lockdown or during the pandemic churches are not open yet in Singapore and I, um, I only see a church group um, I'm part of the Japanese ministry where we do Japanese Bible study twice a month on Zoom and then um, remote church. So that whole thing about still trying to find a church in Singapore and finding a church family who I can really build uh, friendships with combined with the whole pandemic that's going on makes it very difficult to have like really close Christian friends here. Living in countries that have different faiths from my Christian faith has also been helping me um, broaden my perspectives on the world and different people in it. So I grew up in Muslim countries for many years. I lived in Pakistan for um, almost four years and Dubai for five years. And I've always grown up quite conservative. Also because I'm following the rules to respect the law of that land, I would never wear strap tops or short shorts because that is very disrespectful. So just learning how to be respectful to your host country if they have a different faith of yours and learning to be open to discussions um, with people of different faiths has helped me grow in questioning why I believe what I believe and asking the same of others like would you share with me your beliefs and let's talk about that I'm all about open communication and sharing and I think that's that's a very rewarding joy of living a Christian lifestyle abroad is just being able to meet people who have different ways of thinking and how that can help um, reinforce or challenge your own beliefs. The next question is from Mariam K. Was learning Korean grammar hard? 한국어 문법을 배우는 것이 어려웠습니까? 네. 오, 처음에는 꽤 어려웠어요, 사실. It was quite hard in the beginning because uh, Korean was the first uh, Asian language I learned. I had only had experience with English, French, so Korean was uh, had a whole new sentence structure, verb conjugations. Uh, it was tricky, but I never looked at it as this big mountain in front of me. I always thought of it as a uh, baby steps at a time. I actually did not know anything about Korean grammar when I started learning, so I didn't have this whole idea of, oh, it's gonna be so hard um, ahead of me. Whereas when I was learning Japanese, I kind of knew what what Japanese grammar is because it's a bit similar to Korean. And I could prepare myself mentally for the challenge. Whereas with Korean, I was kind of going in blind. I did not even know about K-pop or K-dramas. Like Korean was just a blind challenge for me. So maybe I'm lucky that I didn't have this fear of grammar before I started. And once I was in it, I was too deep into learning Korean to be like, well, this is hard, I'm gonna stop. So. 
I had already committed to that. Um, but it is tricky, and I think the only thing is not to look at how much grammar there is to learn, and just take it little little bits at a time and be patient with yourself. Uh, next question from Thais. Thais? Thais? Uh, when you were learning Korean, did you start to notice you could understand spoke- uh, when did you start to notice you could understand spoken Korean? About 40%. I remember the specific day. Yes, that was the most amazing feeling. I was at a Korean bazaar in South Africa. It must have been around 2011 or 12 about two to three years into uh, learning Korean. At that time, I had been studying Korean a lot every day. I had lessons for about half a year. I had visited Korea once and I was always listening to Korean music. So my ears were very, very exposed to the language. And I think that moment of, wow, I understand this, really came from one of my first longest conversations. So I was talking to someone at the bazaar who had recognized me from a magazine somewhere back in the day. And we were talking in Korean, and at a point in our conversation, I was like, wow, I'm actually having a full-blown conversation. Because up until that point, it had been maybe texting with friends, or just reading content and interacting with that, but not speaking. So maybe before that moment, I could have understood Korean uh, before, but it really hit me when I was like, wow, I can actually have a conversation. So that was about, I would say, two to two and a half years into uh, my Korean learning journey. Next question we have is from Fukurud. Do you think reading a lot is fundamental when learning languages? Uh, thank you for the compliment. Hmm, reading a lot is fundamental. It depends on your goals. Are you looking to interact with content such as books or reading a lot of articles? Is that a skill you want to develop? There are people who are, for instance, just learning Chinese because they want to speak it, be able to order food, um, call a friend, and they don't care about reading at all. So I think this is a very personal choice. I am all for a holistic approach in language learning. As I said before, I like to develop all of these skills of reading, speaking, listening, and writing. It's very, very important for me. Also because I am a bookworm, I just want to read a lot. If that's not important for you, you do you. Um, you are in control of your language learning journey. If that's not something you want to do, don't do it. But if you are looking to learn vocabulary and grammar and writing, Reading ties into that. I mean, you cannot learn grammar if you're not reading about the grammar, right? Or if we talk about learning a language with a new script, a new alphabet, Japanese for instance, how are you going to learn to pronounce Japanese very accurately if you're only relying on romanization? It's a very good idea to learn how to read the language early in the journey. So you can look at it from two perspectives, reading as in the, the object of reading books in the language, or reading as in being able to read the script. As for the latter, being able to read the new alphabet, very important first thing I do when learning a language. As for reading books, up to you. If that's what you want to do, work on that skill. If not, also okay. Next question is from Go Kanbui. Go Kanbui. They are asking, is it possible to learn a language without a teacher or native speakers? And how do you correct yourself without them? Oh, absolutely. There are many languages that I've learned where I did not have any native speaker friends around me. And I just create that environment for myself. I follow people on Twitter who speak the language. I follow Instagram accounts. I watch YouTube videos. You don't need a teacher who can teach you, for instance. There will always be resources online like YouTube videos where people are teaching the language. You just need to go out and look for it. There are tons of language learning apps where you can meet people on. It's possible to start your language learning journey without native speakers and teachers, but it's highly recommended that you do go out and look for them online or in person. Um, how do you get corrections if you don't have a teacher? There is an app I like to use called Hi Native, where you can post something you've written or post a question. You can also do that on HelloTalk, so just make use of the internet. Italki also has a platform where you can meet language exchange partners and ask questions there. Uh, if you are interested, this video is not sponsored by Italki, but if you look in the description of this video, I do have a link where you can get $10 discount um, to an Italki lesson if you are looking for a tutor. Otherwise, just use the website to look for language exchange partners and post your questions there. I list all the resources I use for the languages I learn on my website. 
you can go to lindybuddhist.com slash language dash resources and find resource lists there, all the books and apps I recommend. So do check that out. The last question for today is from Jason. Have you ever considered uh, or tried to start a career based on your language abilities, like translating? Um, are you just passionate about UI UX as you are in language learning? And do you have any interest in literary languages like Latin or ancient Greek? Great questions, Jason. Um, yes, I have thought very seriously about um, pursuing a career in languages, but I think I have so much of a passion for, sorry, my laptop is being weird. <laughs> I have so much of a passion for design and especially UI UX design, especially app design that I don't know if I can tear myself away from that just yet. If I do take a break from, from the tech world and move into um, languages only, I feel like the, the nature of the design and tech world is so fast paced that if I do take a break, I'm gonna fall out of the loop. I might lose some skills that I need to keep working on, um, be out of touch with the software I'm using or design trends or developments in tech. So I, I, I'm too passionate about that to, to break away from that now. Um, I would not enjoy a career in translating or um, interpreting. It's just not what I'm interested in. As for languages in general, not just translating or interpreting, I do want to build um, what I'm doing online a bit more, grow it rather. Uh, I have done a lot of language tutoring that requires a lot of intensive preparation. You are growing with the student as much as you are um, creating resources and teaching them. And it's a very big commitment that I cannot do at the same time as having my full-time job. I would like to keep um, working on some eBooks I'm working on for language learning and keep updating my website and keep creating YouTube videos. And that already is enough having my kind of toes in the water in the language world for me. So I think I'm balancing it quite all right right now. Um, do you have any interest in learning literary languages like Latin or ancient Greek? Yes, I would like to learn biblical Greek um, to understand the Bible a little bit more, but I don't think I'm interested enough in ancient languages to just learn them for the purpose of saying that I can understand them. This has been a long video. Thank you so much for watching. I have not even gone through all of your questions. There are still a few left, so stay tuned for part three. Um, but I hope you guys are doing well. It's almost the end of the year, which feels crazy. Um, if you're still watching until here, you are awesome. Thank you so much. And um, enjoy the rest of your week. Love you guys and see you in the next video. Bye.